Anyway, um, hey, if you're watching the video and you want to participate in the chat, head over to uppercutwoodworks.com slash woodchat slash chatroom and log in with your Twitter account and you can join in the chat. Um, I'm Matt Rattle from Uppercut Woodworks. You can find me on the web at uppercutwoodworks.com uh, or on Twitter at uppercutwood. With me tonight, as always, is the co-host from the Canadian North Tundra, Chris Wong. Hi, hey, Chris. Hello, Matt. Funny, I'm only, what, five hours north of you, not even five hours, just a couple yeah, hours. Yeah, you're probably two hours away. I'm, 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 in, the, I'm in the frozen tundra all of a sudden. <laughs> uh, Chris Wong here from Flare Woodworks. You can find me on Twitter at Flare Woodworks and on uh, my website, flarewoodworks.com. Now, tonight our special guest is Eli Cleveland. Eli, welcome to the show. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> where, where can we find you online? So you can find, uh, I'm here representing the Furniture Project, so you can find us at designbuildshow.com, and then we're also on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Google Plus as Design Build Show. All right. Now, Wait for how, me, Chris. How, I'm waiting for someone to take a cue here. I'm trying to update Twitter right now. <laughs> okay. So, Eli, the reason we asked you here was to um, talk about Design Build Show. There's a lot of woodworkers who are getting to the point where they want to um, – why is my desk jittery? Sorry about that. I'm really not having an earthquake in my house right now. Um, a lot of woodworkers are getting to the point where they want to connect with customers, they want to make sales. Um and they know that they, to reach the kind of clientele they want to get to, they need to get into some of these shows. And so we're trying to help them, number one, find shows um, in their area, um, and then help them be prepared. What, what, do they know, what do they need to do to prepare for a show? And then what do they need to do when they're there to have a, a really successful show? Yeah. Okay. Before we get into that, I guess it would be good to know that neither Matt or I have actually done a show before. Um, I've got two coming up later this year that I'm looking forward to, my first two. And I've done a bit of reading. I know some of the veterans in the in, tweet, in uh, Twitter, like Dale, have got a lot of experience. And we're looking, looking to you here, Eli, for, for some guidance. All right. I'll, hopefully I can lead you in the right direction. Um... Something, so, kind of, my experience with shows was, uh, as a student, um, North Bennett Street had a few shows that they would have a booth at, and, um, and so I'd put my pieces in those and, you know, go down and man the booth for a few hours. And one thing that I noticed that I never liked and that I think is, I've brought with me in, in helping to plan the furniture project is, at a lot of the shows where... Like around here, we have Craft Boston. We have the Fine Furnishing Show, and it's almost entirely furniture makers. It's just booth after booth, and the kind of the vibe in the room is very competitive, very um, customer salesperson. And so I noticed that a lot of people, a lot of uh, attendees, would walk down the aisle, and um, and they wouldn't want to make eye contact with you because they were afraid that you were going to like go into your spiel and you know oh come into my booth and look at my stuff and and um it was just i i never liked the dynamic of it um mm -hmm. so something we've tried to do with the furniture project um from early on we initially i think the first year we did kind of the the larger wood expo show which was the precursor mm -hmm. um we had some ropes out protecting the furniture uh by the end, we had pretty all but taken them down. Um, we wanted people, we wanted the booth to be inviting. So, you know, the, and the idea was don't set it up like a museum. You know, you want people to have a connection with your work, and you want to invite them to touch it. And Yeah, the, you know, you run the risk of something getting scratched or someone sets down a person, it happens. Mm -hmm. But um, but people aren't looking, they don't want to furnish their house with museum pieces that are like, unapproachable. They want something that, that you know they'll have a connection with and they want to sit in and they want to use and things like that. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Something that's real, something that's uh, it's not, not too fragile, I, I guess is a good way of putting it. Right. And, um, and 
So, so that was kind of the first thing was just kind of the dynamic and think about that when you're at a show. Um, you know, just try and be casual. Obviously, everyone wants to sell something. That's why you're there. Yeah. But, uh, but a lot of it is just connecting with people. And so if you can just, you know, kind of you know, start a conversation and casually connect, often then once you start talking, they'll walk into your booth and check your stuff out. Mm -hmm. Wait, so don't set your don't set your booth up like your grandma's formal living room covered in plastic that she never let you in. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. That's um, good advice. Another thing, yeah. even before that, that, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Chris. In some shows, I've seen the furniture built upon plinths. I guess is what what they called usually white boxes. Right. Uh, maybe a few inches tall. What, what do you think of that approach? Um, we use them for, uh, for our show, and it's, I mean, I think it depends on, like, the dynamic you put forth, I think, is more important than the plinth itself. Um, one advantage or disadvantage, it does set the furniture apart a little, so it literally elevates it, and also, you know, it, it kind of, it makes people look at it as a piece of art a little bit. Um, right. A, Something to think about if you have chairs or seating. If it's on the plinth, people aren't going to sit on it, for right. better or worse. If it's on the ground, then you'll be able to invite people in. And, and seating's good because everyone's tired of walking around at these shows. So if you have a chair, then if nothing else, you can be like, hey, you want to take a load off? Um, so yeah, presentation in general is very important. So if the plinth works in the kind of the aesthetic you're building, um, yeah, then, then I'd say go for it. Do people bring their kids to these? Uh, yeah, they do. Um, okay. There's some, I mean, it depends on the show, and that's one of, probably the first thing that I should have said is know the show you're going to. Um, if you can find someone who's been there, talk to them. If you can go the year before, check that out, because each show is going to have a different audience, and um, mm -hmm. right now the Furniture Project is uh, situated in a home show. And so our audience isn't looking to buy thirty thousand dollars pieces of furniture. Right. So it doesn't mean there aren't furniture buyers there, but you know, kind of know, yeah, know who your audience is so that you can you know cater to them a little bit and show things they'll be interested in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's knowing your market. Exactly. Were there were there woodworkers bringing smaller pieces that were selling that the day of the show? People could just buy it and leave with it right there. We have, uh, in general, uh, people do that at our show. We don't let people take it off the floor. Like you have to, the piece has to finish the show, mm -hmm. um, and then if someone wants to pick it up on the way out, that's fantastic. Right. Um, but no, that that does happen, and sometimes uh, Justin De Palma, one of the other organizers, uh, he does one show every year, and he does it with a friend, and Justin does. Uh, high-end furniture, and his friend does kind of, you know, small, like, cutting boards and bowls and things like that, and the way Justin said it works is people see his furniture and get drawn in, and then they walk away with a $30 or $50 cutting yeah. board or something. Mm -hmm. So having that little stuff, it'll help cover the cost of the booth. Right. It's something, there is a price point, you know, probably less than $50 where that's kind of, oh, I have that in my pocket, here you go. Yeah, and that'll, that's kind of like a, a permanent business card, too. Something to remember you by. Absolutely. So instead of just getting a card, you, you get a, a, a cutting board or a stool that you use every day, and someone says, oh, where'd you get that from? Oh, well, there's this guy, he makes these, and he also does this. And there's your lead-in. Yep, exactly. I think I've heard a lot of professional, or a number of professional woodworkers who've done well at shows with just making little stools or little things out of their scraps to to turn that excess material into something profitable and actually making a, a good bit of sales uh, through that item. Mm -hmm. That's why I about uh, kids because if you're, if you're going to offer seating for adults, you could have benches for kids, right? Sell, you could right. sell those. You could have some other things for kids. Um, probably wouldn't be a, a bad idea to have um, bottles of water for people or something too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you could go all out and make a little... Have like a little living room, a little seating area. <laughs> Get a mini fridge. <laughs> yeah, there you go. 
Um, but yeah, a lot of it just comes down to just having a plan going in. Um, one of the other things, like, think of a couple of, it sounds dumb, but have some icebreakers, you know, that's not, hey, have you seen my furniture? Like, you know, just, how are you doing today? Have you have you heard about, if there's like a, a people's choice thing or some some raffle going on in the show, have you heard about the, just, you know, to engage people in a casual mm -hmm. way. Um, and then that the plan needs to extend to, like I said, who's attending the show? What's the market there? Um, okay. What's your goal there? If they have prestigious awards and they have, um, they're going to put out, uh, do a lot of publicity and you'll do interviews, then maybe you're going there to win the show. You know, mm -hmm. so you're bringing the impressive pieces. You're not going to sell them, but it might be worth it to get the publicity. If there are no big prizes or anything, maybe you're bringing the smaller pieces to try and sell off the floor and cover costs, things like that. Gotcha. <laughs> I like what uh, Mark said. Um, I put a bowl of candy in my booth. I put a beer cake in if they let me. <laughs> 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 um, what kind of marketing materials do woodworkers kind of need to remember to bring? Do they typically overlook? Mm. Yeah, so you, you've got to have cards. Um, if you can do, you know, obviously business cards with basic contact info. Um, if you can do some nice, uh, you know, some of the postcards or like, you know, a, um, a pamphlet or, you know, something a little bigger that has some nice photographs of your work. Photographs mm -hmm. are really right. important, obviously. Um, if you can have something like that, uh, that's great. A friend of mine actually... I'm going to run off camera for just one second. I'll be right back. <laughs> sure. Technical difficulties. Do, 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 do. We're back. Okay. Um, a friend of mine actually started doing cheese knives. Oh, And nice. he, he has a duplicator on his lathe, and so he's able to bust it out mm. pretty quickly. And... um. And what he this was a practice one. What he started doing is he actually printed his contact info on the blade. Oh, so cool! It's, you know, it, it's scrap wood. It costs him almost nothing. He can spend a couple of hours the day before the show pumping them out and stamping them. Mm -hmm. But it's something. And part of all of this is you want to set yourself apart. You know, you don't want to just be another guy in a booth. And so this is something where you know they have the stack of business cards. But oh, cool! And you know, you, I use it. You use it. Mm -hmm. Are there woodworkers that actually do uh, do work at the show to show people how this stuff's built? At our show, that's something that early on we figured out um, worked really well for us. And again, it was part of the uh, getting rid of that salesperson dynamic. Because mm -hmm. um, yeah, if you're if you're doing a demo, um, if you're just and not even like a present, if you're just on a bench doing something. A lot of people are just like, "Oh my gosh, someone's like building something." That yeah, <laughs> I didn't know that. Curious, so. right? Yeah, and so they come up and they kind of mill around, and then and that's a great <laughs> way to you know start engaging them, not in a salesy way, but just you know, oh, are you a woodworker? You know, right. you, you know, do you want to try your hand at this if it's safe enough? <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's another way to kind of break down the barrier. Now, obviously, that'd make a bit of a mess that you put wood in it. It, it does, and yeah. you have to. You know, you can plan your demo around what you're doing. Um, like a lathe will make a huge mess. Carving will be kind of wood chips. You can just, you know, a little dust pan, you can sweep it up. Mm -hmm. uh, check with your show if you're going to use a vacuum or something because some, nice. some of, I'm pointing with my knife, that's threatening. Um, <laughs> um, but some, some buildings are union buildings and they uh, have strict rules about uh, who cleans up and things like that. So it doesn't hurt to double check. The union won't let you use a vacuum. Uh, I've heard of that happening. Okay, it, it hasn't happened um, to us, but it's I've heard of it. I've seen that in before. In the, the, I've seen that before in the trade shows in my in my day yeah. job where we're not allowed to plug things in and or use you know it's so. But yeah, I did see a guy who went against the rules and popped a circuit breaker and took out like three booths. So <laughs> <big> <laughs> I worked at some wood wood shows, woodworking shows, where they didn't like us cleaning up because they had staff there who were supposed to clean up. That was their job, and they felt we were doing their job for them. Yeah. 
kind of strange, but it seems odd. But yeah, it just it doesn't hurt to double check with an organizer or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ask ask for ask beforehand is a good so, plan if you want to attend again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. So you guys have done this for a while. What are what are some of the other things that you guys have learned? Like what what are the what are some of the key mistakes that people have made that? Um, I mean, one thing that we every year we struggle with, and and what we try and do a lot is we're we're lucky we're able to get in a lot of um kind of younger. Oh, my internet died. Okay. Um, we're able to get in a lot of kind of up and coming makers, and then also we get some very experienced makers, and so it's a good opportunity to to watch how they work and watch how they kind of work the floor. Um. And it is a lot of what you see, like the experienced people, all the work we have is great, but the experienced people will be constantly engaged with someone. They're always talking to someone. Mm -hmm. And and that's a big thing. You got it, it. We all love to be in the shop, and it's out of a lot of our comfort zones, but you've got to find a way to, you know, just talk to people and just, mm -hmm. you know, be inviting. Right. And I found that activity... It, like you talked about cutting a joint or doing something, activity draws people to your booth. Um, somebody mentioned in Twitter not, not to sit down, and that, that I've seen that at so many shows. Nothing is less engaging than someone sitting there playing with their phone <laughs> even or something. Or yeah, uh, it's not it, how you do it. If you don't look excited to be there, then there's no yeah. way they're going to be excited. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, there's no, there's no mincing words. It's shows are a drag. Like it's a long haul and they're exhausting. A lot of work, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, set up the long days at the shows and then clean up, tear down, go home, unpack. So what about the what about the booth itself? How important is it to have a fancy booth or does a basic booth work okay? Um I, I mean again I think the key if you can get a nice corner booth it always does, you know, it's a lot of traffic, it's more open. Right. What we do with our show is we don't do 10 by 10s. We actually have them take out all the drape. So our oh, space is, our space is both sides of the aisle and 140 feet long. <laughs> um, and that in and of itself, when people walk into our aisle, it's something different, you know? As soon right. as they look down, they notice something's different. Um, and I think... That's the main thing. If you can find a way to set your booth apart, because I mean, a lot of these shows are really expensive. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I mean, corner booths stand out on their own, but uh, but yeah, if you can just find something, putting stuff up on the wall sometimes help. Like if you if you know an artist, one that's if you're not putting stuff on the walls, it's space you paid for that you're not using. Um. So yeah, just something unique, but but classy. Mm -hmm. Keep it classy. Keep it classy, San Diego. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you don't have to invest a lot in, you know, big crazy banners and whiz bang. Because some of the, I've seen some pretty custom booths, not not at furniture shows, but at other shows, um, where it looks like people are, buy, you know, getting like large, I don't know, installations almost of marketing yeah. materials yeah. and slicks and photos and posters and. I, I mean, I, I think if you can have, it's just like with the business card, if you can just have one thing that has, you know, it, you don't want it to be a paragraph. You want, like, maybe one sign, nice name on it, uh, phone number and website type of thing. Yeah. Um, just, you know, again, it, the production value of your booth is, in people's mind, that's going to reflect the production value of your work. Yeah. Um, what about the quality of photos? Have you seen people make mistakes with the quality of photos? Yes, you have to get really nice mm. photos. And a lot of times it's... We used to joke that once you get the photo, just throw the piece of furniture away. Because, <laughs> because you're not going to carry most of your furniture around with you. Most people will never see your mm -hmm. a particular piece of furniture in person. But those mm -hmm. photos are always going to be there, and especially when you're putting stuff up on the web. Mm -hmm. If yeah, the the better the photo looks, the the better your furniture looks. Yeah. Mark Cherry made a comment that he found out that wearing a sport coat 
and looking uh, more professional makes a difference. Don't he said? Don't look like you just came out of the shop. Thank you, thank <laughs> you, with Mark. Mark um, Terry. Uh, yeah, that's that's another thing that we actually uh, address our our exhibitors at the beginning of the show, and and it comes back to and I always fight with this. It's part of woodworking, especially as a business. You are a brand. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And you have to think, you can look like the guy who came out of the shop, and that can be your brand and your aesthetic, but do it consciously and know that that's going to turn some people off. You know, some people are going to be like, oh, cool, I got this furniture from the guy who's just a shop rat. But a lot of casual observers are going to think, oh, that guy looks like a mess. He didn't dress up. Mm -hmm. So I don't yeah, just pay much for his pieces. Exactly, yeah. And, it, you know, <laughs> yeah, it's all about... It, it sucks, but it's a, a lot about presentation and image. <laughs> yeah, it's, we had um, Marie Guarino. Um, I don't know if you all know Glenn Guarino or his work. Um, he's a, a contemporary maker in New Jersey. And um, yeah. uh, Guarino Furniture Designs. Yeah, I'm putting a link. I'll put a link in Twitter right now. Oh, excellent. Um, his wife, Marie, is the, an extraordinary woman. And she came up to the Furniture Project this year and gave a presentation on um, kind of promoting yourself and marketing yourself and how to do a press release and a press packet and all these things. And um, I was only able to listen to parts, but my main takeaway was you have to think about everything. Like she was even talking about at the big shows when you put your press packet in the back room so the press can come and collect all the packets and have the info. You have to think of, like, they thought about what type of folder it was in. You know, some people have these really flashy, sleek folders, and that's not Glenn's aesthetics. They got, like, a recycled uh, folder, and it, you know, it had, had a softer color to it. And just, like, you almost can't go too far with considering, you know, the finer point. Because, again, the more you consider your appearance in people's mind, the more considerate you are on the furniture. Mm. Mm -hmm. When you're showing your furniture at a show, how much emphasis do you put on the lighting that's on your furniture? Do you bring your own lights? Do you go to that degree, or I know the lighting a lot of the convention centers is just yeah broad and sometimes kind of dim, right? Yeah, I, I mean, it, they yeah the lighting in the in the centers usually is not very good. Uh, if you do a higher end show, they'll be in galleries or be in you know presentation spaces. That's usually nice. And they'll take uh, care of that for you. And the big expos, it's usually bad lighting. Um, I haven't. We never went as far as to to do spotlighting or anything. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, my my gut would just be. It's a good idea, but my my only concern would be you you don't want to cross that line into making it. Uh, just a gallery space, you know. You want you don't want people to say, "Oh, what a nice display!" I'm not going in there. Right. Mm -hmm. I guess if you put your things on too high of a stage, then no one wants to be involved. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And I've seen that before a couple of times. And the, one of our um, uh, a couple of years ago, one of our most successful pieces from the show was a uh, it was a simple coffee table. It was um, bent laminations. And it was just a glass top and kind of two bent lamination kind of trestles and then a stretcher. Mm -hmm. And everyone was asking about it. And the guy, like he designed it so that he could produce it fairly rapidly. And, um, you know, the guy had a couple of sales and contacts and he did really well with it. And we talked about one of the reasons we think it did so well is because a lot of the furniture that you, sh and this is again about knowing your audience, a lot of the furniture, people don't understand why it's so expensive. And we all know that it's worth the price you put on it. Mm -hmm. But if people don't understand, and if you're charging, you know, because you have to charge for the time you spend selecting wood and for the, you know, the joinery on the inside that no one ever sees and things like that. And so this piece was very relatable. And the way he described it, he said, when people looked at the really expensive stuff, they felt like there was some, 
like they were missing something. Like there was some inside joke they didn't understand. But when they looked at his table, okay. they could see exactly what it was. They understood it. It was relatable. Hmm. And, you know, that kind of comes back to, you know, don't be standoffish. You want your furniture to be relatable to people. Hmm. That's interesting. I think that's yeah. called, um, so it sounds like a form of imposter syndrome. Um, so do you know how many sales this guy made? He made two at the show, but later? Um, I Last time I talked to him, I think he said he ended up selling, uh, I think he had like, I think he had one at the show and then maybe three in, you know, probably the year afterwards. Mm -hmm. It's actually the guy that does these knives, too. <laughs> how, much of the, um, how much of that was his pricing? Was his, was his pricing also pretty reasonable? Wait, and that's what really tied in. No, that, mm -hmm. you're right on. That, that tied into it was people, are, you know, they looked at the piece, said, I like that. What's the price? His price was very reasonable. And especially, again, for our show, being a home show, the price point's a little lower. Um, yeah. So it was it was right within that range that people were willing to spend, and um, yeah, so that helped a lot. And he wasn't. You have to be careful with price, and pricing's always it gets everyone. Um, yeah. Yeah. He wasn't underpricing it at all. He had he had thought about a way to produce it quickly so that he could keep the price down. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, how do you label your? Do you have any documentation with? It? The pieces that you show, do you have a sign or a price tag, or is it just a piece that's sitting in the in the booth? Um, uh, different people do different things. Uh, personally, uh, it, it's and, hard. You could go different yeah. ways with it because the prices right. can be intimidating, and it can kind of even if it's subconsciously remind people that this is a you know, you are trying to sell them something. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, a lot of times you want people to know what they're getting into. Yeah, that's exactly it. Um, yeah. Or, or, or it might, they might think it's out of the range, the price range, but if you have a price tag, and, and they won't ask, but if you have a price tag, they might see it and they might think it is affordable. Right, right. Um. So speaking about pricing, um, it'd be interesting if you could talk about some pricing strategies, and especially I know that part of the design build show is about trying to educate the consumer about the quality of stuff that they'll that they'll get. What are tips for helping to educate the consumer? Because I I, I have to imagine that once they understand, um, the the price the pricing will become more acceptable to them. Um, it does, and you still get the. Kind of the people you see are the ones who a lot of people walk up and they're like, "That's absurdly priced. You're a scam artist," and yeah. they just aren't having it. Um, when you have more educated consumers, it, what I like to hear is even if they say that's way too expensive for me, they at least say, "I understand." You know, okay, yeah. I understand that price. I'm still not going to pay it, but um, mm -hmm. there's a difference between saying that's not worth that much money and I can't afford that yet. Right. 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 <laughs> um, and so part of it, uh, the demos, I think, actually do help because people can spend a few minutes and see, like, wow, that person's, like, really spending a lot of time on just, you know, what's going to be a tiny piece of that piece of furniture. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, a lot of it's just kind of talking about what goes into it. We're actually uh, we're going to do a second show this year. It's actually in... A week and a half. <laughs> um, there's a second home show this year um, outside of Boston and Foxborough. So if anyone's in the area, come visit us. Um, there'll be some information going up on our website this weekend. And part of that, we're going to have a display, and it's going to show from drawing through completion the stages of a furniture build. Oh, that's great. That's a great and idea. That, and, and the idea is to show, like, when you're buying a custom piece, this is what you're getting. It's a drawing, it's selecting lumber, it's doing joinery, it's shaping, it's the whole nine yards. Um, so yeah, that's, yeah, anyway, and yeah, anyway you can educate the consumer. And you don't want to be lecturing them, but just, you know, have, you know, have a, a kind of a plan of, you know, here are a couple of points I want to hit, like this piece, like, 
oh yeah, that carving, like I spent a long time laying it out and this and that, mm-hmm. or oh, those curves. Uh, something something about each piece that kind of reminds them, like, this is custom work. Mm-hmm. Are there any um, specific styles people are looking for, or is it all over the place? Um, i trying to think about what we've sold. It's been... I think our sales have been a little more um, contemporary. We've definitely sold some traditional pieces as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm sure that'll vary by the the market too. Um, right. The East Coast, West Coast, uh, Canada. Yeah. Where, no, absolutely. You, yeah. <laughs> that, Matt, that's you, a really. Oh, go ahead. Matt, do you have any idea of w- what the market is in your area? W- what people want? Uh, I um, mean. Oh, Matt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. It, it's all over. I, I still get yeah. I still get solicited by people who want. Something that they saw in a catalog, um, painted white, oh, okay. um, but yeah. they want it to their custom dimensions, and they want it cheaper. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I think I, I think I need to get connected more with the people who who are going to the shows. But a lot of the a lot of the furniture in, um, in Seattle, in the nicer homes or the nicer um, nicer buildings, is um, a lot of fur. Oh, clear, okay. clear, straight grain fur, um, and a lot of it is is like like m- missiony Asian. You know what I mean, Chris? Uh, sounds kind of like the mantle you did, maybe. The what? The mantle. Kind of. Um, there's a um, there's a resort that my wife and I stayed outside of stayed in outside of Victoria. That was very much like that. It's all, you know, clear finish. It's not dark. Um, fur, um, big chunky, you know, legs and 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 cross members and stuff like that. But um, I'll try and send you some pictures. It's it's like craftsman style with a Asian flair, I guess I'd say. So I'm not describe it. Okay. <laughs> Um, I'm thinking lots of straight lines, and um, yep. yep, I can't really elaborate too much more on that. Let me get, that let me, I'll, find, I'll find you a picture. Sure. Um, I know exactly where to go to. I think. Okay. Eli, if you can go back a minute to uh, pictures, um, you're talking about displaying them in a in an album. Yes. Now, do you just do you have a dedicated table for that, or do you if you're do you want to put it on a table that you're also trying to show off and sell? Or is that a bad idea? Uh, I don't. I've never had a problem putting things on my furniture. Uh, okay. I think, especially if it looks natural. It, again, I think it breaks down that barrier of kind of the the untouchable museum piece. Right. Um, it invites people to interact with it. Right. And then a lot of people these days use tablets, and those are, you know, like we were saying, very classy, very. Um, right. And everyone, you know, like again, you pick it up and you touch it, and it. Those are nice. <laughs> I can't deny yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess uh, the clientele needs to be familiar with that to, uh, to operate the tablet. Obviously, a, a photo album anyone can can use can fit there. Right, right. Uh, I was at a craft show, uh, Circle Craft, which is the biggest craft show in Vancouver last uh, winter, just before Christmas. And I think the busiest booth was a guy selling tongue drums or split drums, and he had a whole he had. I don't know, dozens of drums set up there, people, and people could try them and use them. And he had a small, he had a, a TV screen with a video looped, maybe a two-minute clip of uh, how to make how he makes the drums. And I, I thought that was a really good way to engage people, both they can try the product and hear what it does, see what it does, and get a feel for it. And also, if you didn't want to participate, you can watch uh, the video and see how he makes them. It kind of draws them in without him even having to address you, you can uh, involve yourself. Right. That's really smart. So Chris, I put a couple links in the uh, Hangout chat to show you. Um, right. Uh-huh. I, don't, I don't know any better. It's, it's kind of Northwest contempor- contemporary, I guess. Can I put those into Twitter too? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. I'm trying to find some pictures from the uh, Northwest um, 
There we go, Northwest Woodworkers Association. Mm -hmm. No, where did it go? We had talked about it last week with Mark Hochstein. He had gone there. Hmm. It's interesting, lately the people I've been talking to, I've been hearing more and more um, people saying like, oh, you know what the best show is? And it's it's not one of these big shows. It's their local arts and crafts festival or something mm, like that. Right. Now, how far away do you attract makers for your show? Uh, this year, we actually were really happy. We had someone come up from uh, Florida. Yeah. We had a wow, guy okay. down from Toronto, and we had someone from Michigan. And then, um, wow. you know, a bunch of kind of New Englandy people, and then uh, a couple of guys from New York, and Glenn uh, up from New Jersey as well. Hmm. So this was a yeah, this was a great year for getting a good variety. And do you see different styles from the different regions too, or do they overlap? Are they distinct enough? Um, I mean, it's such a small sample, you know, just individual people. So, right. uh, so yeah, fair representation, I guess. Yeah, it was hard to pick out, like, okay, everyone south of, you know, Connecticut's building this, and everyone west of Pennsylvania. Yeah, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But on that side of the river, they don't use walnut. <laughs> Nobody on that side of the river uses walnut. Don't use walnut on that side. Yeah. Uh, Scott says the southwest, southwest is all about Ikea. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's true or not, but <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> I think that um, the style on up in my area, uh, Vancouver area, is uh, fairly contemporary. I see a lot of light colors, um, a lot of white and glass uh, materials being used, as well as live edge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, period stuff, as others noted, isn't isn't particularly popular. Yeah, that's not in Seattle either, because Seattle was founded after that, right? Right. So we do get a lot of um, we do get a lot of contemporary. Um, it's it's there, there's a there's a there's a lot of. I mean, Daryl Pear is out here making green and green. He, yep. He's in Seattle, um, but I don't know. I, I think he sells most of his stuff um, to Cal to to either people who moved up here from California or um, are down in California. Mm -hmm. This is uh, crazy. Um, Scott posted this on Twitter. Um, an American high boy, I don't know what the quality is, I don't know the, the make or the brand, um, $650. I think that says a lot about the, about the demand for this type of furniture. Wow. Ouch. Um, it's in a store. I don't know if it's brand new or it doesn't in look, a used store. It doesn't look brand new. No. Yeah. yeah, that's also about to apply um, to DJO, DJO Furniture Maker. Yeah, Dale. I don't Dale. know his name. Yeah. Dale. Um, yeah, you said period furniture is down, and I was going to say, and, um, yeah, I mean, New England will always have a market for period furniture. Yeah. But it is, mm -hmm. it's, I mean, it it's seems like niche. Yeah, it's an increasingly small market, and there's a lot mm -hmm. of competition for that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, design build show. You guys are going to do a second show. Have you guys thought about um, traveling or, or going on the road or having more shows nationwide? Or uh, we have, we absolutely have, and um, yeah, this was our kind of our big kind of coming out as the furniture project and um, and rebranding this year. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, hopefully. Um, yeah, we're we're not quite there yet, but we're looking that that's part of the plan. We want to kind of bring the idea around the nation and get more people out there in front. Yeah. The the whole kind of goal is to get furniture making back in front of the public. Yeah. Cuz mm -hmm. so much of it is done um you know like we have these woodworking communities and it's a, a lot of us talking to each other. And yeah, yeah. yeah we we want to move the conversation back into the public sphere and you know, mm -hmm. and I think 
it ties in well with all the like locally made and quality goods and that whole trend that's coming up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, go ahead, Matt. Here the last. So this is the third year or the fourth year? This was the fifth year, maybe. Okay. I'll say fifth. <laughs> okay. Um, are you getting more? Are you getting more traffic? Are you getting more sales? More woodworkers? Um, the the response from woodworkers has gotten better every year. Uh, the furniture gets better and the variety gets better. Um, so yeah, that's been fantastic. The this year the home show itself had a very slow year, mm-hmm. um, and so that's. And that was everyone in the show was talking about that. I mean, Saturday's always busy, but uh, Friday night's usually busier than that, and Thursdays are always dead. Mm-hmm. Um, but so it had a slower than normal year, but uh, but we still had uh, we you know it's hard to track numbers because we're just within the larger show. Yeah. But uh, but especially Saturday we had you know good traffic people through all day, so um. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's hard to say. And that's why we're trying out this second home show this year. We're going to see how, you know, again, what the market is there, see how the fit is for us, and, yeah, kind of keep shopping around. Do you think someone attending a show should expect to cover the booth costs or make a profit or just go there to promote their brand? Uh, and that that's something I would say you always hope to cover your costs. Um mm-hmm. But I think you have to balance it. Uh, it that's going to be a fact. It's going to be a result of kind of the price of the booth. Um, of if it's a little bit, if it's a little bit cheaper, it's it's you might be more willing to take the risk of showing flashier pieces that won't sell, right? Just to build your reputation. Right. That's a really good point. Um, sh- would you bring piece? How many pieces do you bring that you that you don't think will sell? Um, I think Nick Rulo was. He posted a picture of, uh, I think it was a cabinet with a political political statement on the front of it, and I don't think that person expected to sell it. I don't know if it did sell, but it, oh, it'll, it it'll bring people sell. to your booth, right? Exactly. And he was really pleased with uh, his experience because, mm-hmm. yeah, he. I mean, he wanted to sell it, but um, right. but no, he. We were talking to him afterwards, and he said how. Everyone who walked through the booth, no matter what, they stopped and they looked at his cabinet, you know, and they kind of, you know, kind of came over, and gave it a second look. He had like some uh, some literature around it, right. so he, everyone who went through, he got eyes on his cabinet, you know, and a card or got their name in his head or his name in their head, something like that, and that was that was a large part of his goal. Mm-hmm. He, he was he's trying to reestablish himself. Um, he moved and he's been doing cabinetry and he's trying to. Reestablish himself in furniture, so it was, he was trying to make a splash. So uh, it was an effective marketing tool, but maybe not in a. Uh, what wasn't a, a money making, a direct money making tool. Right, and a lot of. I would say in general, spec work is. I mean, it's it's always risky, um, and especially when you're doing custom work. People. A lot of times you hear, "Oh, I want that exact piece, just a different wood and an inch shorter." You know, um, yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's always. I have a house full of my own. I've furniture. got a hacksaw right here. <laughs> Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you know, you build the piece. And it, yeah, yeah. You have to find the balance. It's you want to show mm-hmm. something that's a reflection of your style and and your uh, your right. ability, but yeah, you can't keep making it for free. No. Um, how was the design build show marketed in the, in the local area to get people to show up? Is it radio, TV, newspaper? So it goes out. I mean, obviously, we send it out through all the um, all our internet channels. Um, we talk to all the local schools and uh, guilds and things like that. We sent out uh, postcards to kind of you know we send like batches of postcards to different guilds and schools. And then we also would send out some targeted ones. Um, we reached out to local galleries um, and different. We have a couple of publications in the area we were able to go through woodworking ones. 
we also, this was the first year we took out three advertisements in New England Home Magazine. Um, we went with them because they're, you know, they're focused on New England, and they have a very targeted circulation. So their, um, their readership has, you know, the, the annual income's over $100,000 a year. Yeah. You know, they, they send it around to trade shows. We, we went to some networking events for different uh, design firms and handed out business cards and talked. And that's really, that's a balance we've been trying to strike is, you know, we love having the woodworkers there and the whole, you know, kind of communal just talking about woodworking vibe, again, breaks down the, the sales barrier. Yeah. But, um, but, yeah, the people that buy furniture usually aren't woodworkers. And so... Yeah, you got to get the word out to them, too. Getting in touch with the design community, getting in touch with architects, people like that, that's really important. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that's, yeah. I talked to some people in the past about... I think it was a school show, or it was like... I, I think it was in the Southwest, and um, it was like some of the final projects that a bunch of students had made. And the comment was that they did a good job on the furniture, but they all did a horrible job with their finish. Oh. Mm. Um, have you seen much of that, or, or are you... Uh, we oh, yeah. are talking about finishing a lot. You get a lot of woodworkers on here are like, man, this thing is so great, I don't want to put a finish on it because I'll screw it up. <laughs> no, it's... Yeah, I mean, I... Not to make too blanket of a statement, but I think a lot of woodworkers hate finishing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it is. I have. N I have no problem hiring a finisher to finish my stuff. Uh, yeah. I I know basic finishing, and so <laughs> if it's a really simple project, um, I'll I'm happy to do it. But yeah, if I spend a lot of time on a piece, you can, you can waste a lot of time on the finish, or you can make it look like it's worth less than it is. Yeah. Um, so just like a good photo, a good finish can, you know, just make it that much better. So for me, it's worth. I, it's a whole other art, and it's not one I'm interested in learning. Yeah. But yeah, we definitely have people. <laughs> uh, we do critiques in our show, and a couple years ago, we were trying out a new guy with critiques, um, and he, <laughs> critiquing's an art. Yes. Um, he was spot on with all of his criticism. Like, there was no denying he was right, but, man, he was up front. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, but, no, he was walking around, and almost every piece he was like, that finish is no good, that finish is no good, that finish is no good. And then he'd tell you why, and it was, yeah, it, it is. Right. Yeah, it's hard. I, I've seen a bit of a trend of uh, environmental furniture that's unfinished because it's... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to think of that. Then yeah. let's finish and sell it for more. Yeah, because <laughs> it's green. Yeah. <laughs> no VOCs. <laughs> yeah. So you have had people. You have you have had woodworkers in your furniture show that probably probably could have done a better job finishing their piece. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and that's. One of the reasons we do the critiques is, again, um, I mean, what we're trying to do is we're trying to, we, the first year we're all about educating the consumers. You know, like we just, we need to get it out there, we need to explain to them this is why it's nicer. Quickly we figured out we, we need to educate makers a lot as well. Um, you know, talk about things like branding yourself and promoting yourself. And then also we do these critiques and like I said, we get very experienced makers there. We have like Tom McLaughlin and Glenn Guarino and Phil Lowe. And, uh, and we get them to stand there. And we have some online. And we'll, um, we're they're editing the videos now. So keep an eye on our, uh, our social feeds, and we'll have some critique videos going up. And they sit down, and they, they tell a maker what they did right and what they did wrong and you know how, how the piece can be executed better, designed better, shown better. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you do you think that do you think that certain woodworking shows or certain shows would have a negative impact um, for your business? There's a lot of craft shows, and would would they have a a, a negative in, impact somehow? Uh, they 
may not be as strong as a furniture show, obviously, but yeah. right. Yeah, I can't think of anything offhand. I mean, unless it's, I can't think of any realistic situations. <laughs> oh, I was, okay. I was thinking of totally absurd like things. Um, I think if it's, I you know, I think being at a craft show is not going to hurt you. Um, I think more emphasis and more significance is going to be the way you present yourself at that show. You know, so even right. if it's a craft show with smaller stuff, if you're still there, you know, and maybe you change your demeanor a little bit, maybe you're a little more relaxed, you know, you bring some slightly lower lower end pieces, you know, nicely yeah, done. We'll take it. Yeah. But yeah. um but yeah, I think as long as you represent yourself well well, I I think it'd be very hard for a show to hurt your reputation. Mm. Okay. Cool. Well, do we have any other qu any other questions? From I'm looking in the in the Twitter feed right now. It looks. It looks like we we've covered we, things. I think we did pretty well. Well, the one thing I want to respond to. I'm looking at Randy Glissman. Yeah had a comment about um, fr it's frustrating in my area to even find juried shows for woodworking. It's all about jewelry, pottery, and photography. <laughs> um, that is a problem, and juried shows are great because um, like to, to the point that you were just asking about, mm -hmm. I don't think a show can hurt you. A juried show can help you because an open mm -hmm. show says nothing about your furniture. If you're in a juried right. show, just being there raises your estimation in people's eyes. Like, oh, they were selected out of some amount of people. We don't know how many. But um Okay. Okay, well here's a question then. How, how do you what tips do you have to get into a jury show? To get into it to build nice work. <laughs> um, nice work. Also good photos, obviously. No, good yeah, do make sure your work is the the piece that you present to them or the pieces that you uh, submit are executed very well. Uh, and then send in a really high quality photo so that they can see that. Um, it you, if you get a photo that's not great or it's a little blurry on the corners and things like that, you don't trust the work. Um, also, look at what look at the aesthetic. A lot of times, not always, but a lot of times, a jury show will have an aesthetic, like it's a contemporary show or it's a uh, it's a period show right. or maybe they're showing a lot of local craft or a lot of uh, what it, wooden or metal stuff. Look at what that is and try and tweak your designs or, you know, if you have time to build a piece for the show, try and adjust your, your designs so that it's, it appeals to them. Hmm. Um, how many pieces would you present? Obviously, you don't want to present 50 pieces to a jury show. Would you limit uh, it to three pieces or... Sometimes they'll, have, sometimes they'll have a limit. I don't think there's a magic number. Um, okay. uh, yeah, I think... I, mean, I think three to five is reasonable. Five's mm -hmm. maybe a little eager. Um, but yeah, I, I think often there's a suggestion and or I don't know why you couldn't just you know send them an email. Hey, do you have a right. limit on submissions? Mm -hmm. Would you keep those those three or four or five pieces um, fairly consistent, or would you would would you um, do you have any? Would you not want to show too much diversity in your work? Right, and that's that'll partially go to the aesthetic of the show. Um, mm -hmm. We we have one maker, Kevin Mack, who comes back year after year, and one thing that looks great about his furniture is he started building kind of almost sets of furniture, and it looks really nice together because each piece enhances the others. Mm -hmm. um, and, and also. Another thing, and this helps with making yourself stand, stand out, it's hard to do, but if you can find a specialty or a style or some design features that are clearly you, then that helps separate you. Because it's really hard to sell yourself as I can, you know, what do you want? I can build it. Yeah, I can, yeah, yeah. That's building and, a brand. Building name. Right. It's much easier to build a brand around, oh, I want, you know, kind of Asian inspired. Contemporary work. This is the guy who does Asian inspired for whatever. I yeah. do carving. Right. I do this. Yeah. Yeah. Then you just have to become the best at what you do. <laughs> yeah. 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 
I've got uh, one more. Oh, go ahead. Well, no, I just wanted to finish up with uh, with Randy Glissman. Um, oh. One thing you can try and do if you can't find any juried shows, um, you know, go to any shows. Try to um, either talk to the organizers of some of those other art shows and see if you can squeeze in. Right. And also, if you know someone, like if it's a pottery show, find a potter who's going in that show and see if you can build stands or something for them. That is a great idea. No. Or get a photographer to photograph your furniture and then put it in the show. Exactly. There's always... There's always a way. <laughs> How effective do you think it is to have stands for a potter at a show where obviously he's got his pots and his cups on top of your, on top of your stand? Is that, is that going to be an effective tool? What it's going to do, it may not, you know, if, if you can make them in your style and all that, it's great, you know, if you have a really unique mm -hmm. design. Um, but what it does is um, you want to put your your work in front of the people who buy it. And so the right. people who buy high-end pottery are going to want a place to display it. You know? Mm -hmm. And so you may not, you know, you, people may not be looking at the stand like, wow, like, get that pot out of the way. What's that stand in there? Yeah. <laughs> but at the same time, if they have, you know, if they're buying these high-end, like, sculptural pieces and think they need a place to put them. And so if you can, if you can come up with stands that really complement the piece, the piece... Like it, it'll show as a unit. You're like, wow, what a nice piece! What a nice display! This whole thing, you know. And you just ask the person to have your card on there or a little price tag. However, you you want to work it out with them. Um, it certainly isn't yeah. going to hurt your chances. And at the very least, other potters might want to buy your stands. That's true, and that's yeah. um, some advice I was given was I was asking about galleries in the Boston area, and uh, the person I was talking to said they. They never put their work in galleries. They said, if I build a music stand, I go to a music store and ask them if I can put it there. If I build a tea mm -hmm. caddy, I go to a, a tea shop and see if I can like put it, put your furniture in front of the people who, who use it. Hmm. Yeah, my first thought when uh, you mentioned stands was to build some, build something like a drop front desk, which has an angled front, so they can only display a few <laughs> things on top of it. <laughs> <laughs> Very sly. <laughs> it'd be a nice piece of furniture, and it, it, it would enhance the overall appeal of the booth. <laughs> Very smart. Well, it's it's the same. The other thing, if you can work out a deal like, oh, I'm waving the knife again. Terrible. <laughs> I'm gonna cover off this crazed butter man. <laughs> um, the other thing is, if you can work out a deal with someone like that, the same as at a furniture show. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> On guard. <laughs> Um, at a furniture show, if you can find uh, a painter or a photographer or something to hang their work on your walls, you can split booth space also. Right. And wow. so if you find oh, a potter that's... who's willing to do that, say, hey, I'll split the booth space with you as I can try and put my furniture in your booth. That's a good idea. And that way you're not competing with each other. You're, you're both benefiting. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Make the frames. Find a photographer yeah. and make his frames, maybe. <laughs> yeah. I was I was at an art gallery and I kind of got bored, so I was studying all the picture frames and the guard, guard saying, "Get away from the picture! I'm just looking at the frame." <laughs> all right. Um, I, I had one more question for you, Eli, um, yes. regarding uh, sales. How important do you think it is to accept credit cards at a show? Um, I I don't think it hurts. Especially if, you know, it d depends on what you're selling, but like we were saying, under 50 bucks, people might have on hand. Right. Um, if you can do a credit card, then maybe it pushes it to, you know, a hundred or a couple hundred dollars that they'll pay, like, on the spot. Okay. Hmm. So um, it's a definite asset. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think a lot of people are going to be like, hey, $2,000, swipe, and just pick it up. Um, right. But, you know you have that ability if you have the credit card, but I do think it pushes that kind of um, impulse buy limit a little higher. Okay. As far as selling a big piece of furniture, do you think it would deter someone if they had to pay cash or write, write you a check? Or would you accept a check at a show or something they can carry away at the end of the show? I it's kind of risky. Any payment. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, um, money. Yeah, no, I'm not. <laughs> I'm, not <laughs> I'm not particular. Um... Um, I, I mean, I think, 
Again, I don't think accepting credit cards is ever going to hurt you. Okay. Yeah. That's one thing I'll have to organize before my show start. Yeah, and more and more people I see are using Square. Or, yeah, yeah. I'll have to figure yeah. that out. Do you need a, a data connection for that, I guess? Yes. Okay. Your cellular connection will work. You don't, you don't need Wi-Fi, but you, need, you do need data. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, into that. Were there have many people been uh, taking taking commissions at Design Build Show at the Furniture Show? Uh, it's we don't track sales like so we know if something sells at the show. Uh, mm -hmm. After the show, we you know, we try and keep up with our makers, mm -hmm. but uh, but yeah, it's hard to say how many. Okay. Of the contacts lead to commissions afterwards. I was wondering if they. I was wondering if they took deposits. Uh, I haven't heard of anyone taking deposits at the show. Uh, okay. You know, a lot of people talk about. You know, I made a contact. They're gonna, you know, call me back, or I'm supposed to call them next week, stuff like that. Um, but no, I haven't heard of that. Cool. I know that galleries are. They typically charge maybe forty to fifty percent for a commission. Is yeah. that the same for a show as well? Um. Or is there a commission at all if you're paying for boost space, or how does that work? Um, I'm trying to think. I'll say it depends on the show. Offhand, I don't know. The the sh the shows I'm familiar with take um. If you're going to direct sell from your booth, they just mm -hmm. charge you an extra fee up front for the booth space. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, okay. Regardless of how much you sell. Right, yeah, if you want okay. to be able to sell things from the show, they charge you, it's, you yeah. know, instead okay. of $16 a foot, or a square foot, it's 17 or something like that. Okay. Yeah. That sounds fair. Yeah, better than 50%. Yes, much better. <laughs> so the, the booth space is usually about 17 bucks a square foot? Uh, that's how much it is at the home show. That is right. actually very expensive. Um. I know the Providence Fine Furnishing Show is, uh, I think, what is it, 10 or 12 a square foot, and uh, that's more common, so around 1000 bucks for a 10 yeah. by 10. Yeah, um, I think. Yeah, the, the home shows, because uh, it's, you know, in Boston, it's at a big convention center, so it's, it's expensive. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, fellas, we are after time. You want to wrap it up? Yeah, I think I think about the questions. Cool. Well, hey, Eli, we really appreciate you coming. We know it's late over there for you, um, but you know, we really want to get uh, woodworkers building their best stuff, showing it to the right clients, able to make a living and make more furniture. Hope you guys take this thing. Uh, national um, and uh, get the get the news out there because I'd I'd love it if we could um, have more people like you said you know building furniture in their local communities for their local communities you know out of the wood that grows you know within a 50 mile radius or whatever and all that so that'd be great so really appreciate you coming and sharing your tips with everybody so thank you absolutely thank you thank you so much for having me yeah no problem. And um, we can have a, a wood, we can have a wood chat show, Matt. We can jury. Yeah, you must be in wood chat to participate. Yeah, you sounded like you were on a submarine again, so I didn't hear it. <laughs> <laughs> they have frozen Canadian internet. <laughs> so we'll probably watch you back next year, Eli, to hear how the show went, or maybe yeah, in a couple of weeks to hear how the you guys are having a show in a week and a half. Maybe in a maybe in a month or so, come and tell us how that show went. Yeah, yeah, I'll definitely check in. Cool. Sounds good. Right on. Well, that is bring us, some, bring us some pictures. For, um, yeah. What's that? Yeah, pictures would be bring great. Bring us some pictures. We will. And we we have a bunch of media from uh, this year's or from this past show that'll be yeah. going up in the next couple of weeks, and then yeah, I'll awesome. take a bunch more next week. Oh, I remember one last question. Did um, Marie uh, Garino's presentation to woodworkers get videotaped? It all gets videotaped. And it's going to be on the website. So yeah, so keep your eyes out. We have we have oh, some really good stuff. That'd and Rob, Rob Boys did a great demo on videoing your work and getting it, documenting it online. So, cool. Yeah. 
Cool. Rob Boys, he is the uh, underwear model of the woodworking community. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that right, Eli? I have no response to that. <laughs> cool. Well, everybody, that is a wood chat from March 13th, 2013. Our special guest today was Eli Cleveland. Um, helping us out with uh, talking about furniture shows and how to prepare for them and how to uh, make sure you have a successful show. Um, with me tonight was Chris. Yo, Chris. Chris Wong here, Flay Woodworks, signing off for tonight. Cool. Say goodbye, Eli. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Thanks, Thanks for coming for being in the show. <laughs>